Okay, that should be live now. Can you can you hear me okay, Rami? Yeah? I can hear you great, Jack. Brilliant, brilliant. So how are we doing, guys? It's episode three of the podcast now. So we're we're starting to get into the weeds of them a bit. Um we have Rami Korhon from Finland, who's a Bitcoiner and he owns um a tech company uh associated with all kinds of IT projects and infrastructure. They have a bit of involvement in Bitcoin as well. Um, and I met Rami at the recent Bitcoin event. We were talking about Bitcoin for a couple of hours, and now here we are on this podcast. So, um, yeah, just to start, Rami, like, uh, if, if you just want to give a, like a background of yourself, um, your company, and then your, I suppose, your whole Bitcoin orange pill journey, how you ended up. Did, did you make a lot of the same mistakes I did along the way? Um, and yeah, but what's 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 the story with uh with your Bitcoin journey? Yeah, so um I've been in tech industry since like the turn of the century. Uh I graduated from university after studying like social sciences and stuff, but got a fateful phone call from a couple of friends who said that hey, mobile phones are gonna be a big thing in the future. So we should find found a company to do services for those. So we started a company called Small Planet. We did that for about 10 years. We sold uh, different platforms for mobile operators around the world, around early mobile gaming and and chat, chatting and, and dating apps and these kind of things. The first generation of mobile, so to speak. And then 2009, we started the company that then evolved into Oivan, which is the company where I'm the CEO today. And with that company, it was just the idea to to kind of use our expertise in building digital services to build stuff for others. So find clients that are have some vision, business need, but they don't have the technical capabilities of building it themselves. So we started making mobile apps, web services. And over time, we started to grow that business. Then I went away from uh, Eva. That was the company called at the time. I went to US to do some music startup projects for a couple of years. And uh, funnily enough, I lived in in Soma in San Francisco 2012, 2013. So very close to where the early Bitcoin meetups were, but uh, I didn't stumble upon those those meetups at the time. And and then I came back to Finland uh, and, and went back to this Eva company. And then uh, around 2016, we acquired a small three person, like uh, highly talented uh, tech company called Movila. And, uh, and then one of them, came to work with us and uh, he always had like Bitcoin price chart on his laptop every every minute. <laughs> that was 2016. I was like starting to get more curious. Obviously, I had heard about Bitcoin early, early on, but I had the usual thing that it's probably for mostly criminals and, you know, drug users and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but then, uh, yeah, I started to gain more interest. Uh, then I started to uh, think about it from the kind of business perspective as well. There was a lot of that blockchain, not Bitcoin narrative going on and uh, started reading some books and getting more into it. And finally, in 2017, I purchased some Bitcoin. And then uh, that was luckily a little bit after the big top. And, and then I started to kind of go to different conferences from the kind of blockchain angle in a way. Uh, and um, but over time, maybe in a year or so uh, i invested in some of the altcoins or shitcoins uh but more, mainly bitcoin but then i thought that like yeah everything else <laughs> seems kind of shady so i started to kind of divest away from everything else and my conviction in bitcoin grew and i'd say around 2019 20 i, I became like uh, only interested in in bitcoin as as, as a person our company uh, oivan which it is called today after a merger with it in 2020 we are about 220 people and we have offices in five countries we do a lot of international like big digital transformation projects uh so we have some uh, bitcoin related stuff that we do here so originally this company we bought in 2016 they had uh, been helping build one quite famous uh bitcoin slash crypto broker here in finland so we've been working with th those guys and then we have our own little product as well for for like uh, legacy financing institutions, if they want to start offering Bitcoin uh, saving as a product, then we have like a nice white table platform that they can pretty much plug plug and play uh, without having to build it themselves. So, uh, and then uh, over time, um, I started thinking also like, could I do something else than than just like 
be interested and uh, and save in Bitcoin and then do some stuff around Oivan, which is the company that I work at. Uh, and I have this kind of a second life um, besides business that I've been playing in in a punk rock band since like uh, the 90s. And uh, about two years ago, I did a lot of business trips in the Middle East and, and I had those kind of two week trips where I the weekend there was kind of boring because there's not a lot of like nightlife activities or anything like that. So I just found an old guitar from one of those uh, houses that we stayed in and started uh, writing some acoustic songs. And I thought like, mm, well, I don't want to write about the same stuff that I write in my, my main band, which is called Fumble, uh, that I want to write about something else. And then I thought that hmm, maybe I could just do some like uh, Bitcoin culture related themes. And then I started this project called The Higher Low, which I released the first song in January and I've been just gradually putting some songs in YouTube and having fun with it and some people have also found it entertaining. I even did one show <laughs> show and today uh, I'm doing my main job here at Oivan and then uh, uh, being as all of us plebs, you know, spending a lot of my time in the in the driver's seat in the car listening to, you know, Rocket uh, Tales from the Crypt and <laughs> this kind of this, this kind of stuff and uh, just being happy that I, I discovered it early on and uh, trying to kind of uh, find ways to uh, kindly educate the rest of the world as, as we all do to, to get as many people on this this board as we can. Yeah. And what what you say the higher low is, is do you say this is Bitcoin music, is it like Bitcoin orientated band? Yeah. So the idea is that uh, these are like acoustic songs like maybe similar to when um, like Frank Turner started as just man and a guitar. So the same thing that I don't have any any backing band. I do everything by myself, 100% do-it-yourself do it stuff. And the idea is just to do this kind of a pop punk type of songs acoustically that sing about the kind of pleb culture, Bitcoin culture without ever saying the word Bitcoin. So like if you start listening to that music and you know something about this scene, then very quickly you will discover what I'm singing about. But the idea is that also make the songs that other people can enjoy them. So I've had some some of my old friends and people who have been following my main band for a long time. Uh, I have actually found those songs as, as like just fun, catchy little songs without even knowing that I'm talking about like, you know, Satoshi and that kind of stuff in those songs. So <laughs> that's kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah, you'll have to send me the link after and I'll link it in the description. But um, yeah, no, because there, there was a, very recently there was some viral um, uh, yeah, I was just wondering was it was it was it your music for a second? But yeah, you you said there was it might have been that other person that they went totally viral. It was about um it was to do with Nick, Nick Carter. Uh it's like Star yeah. Wars. <laughs> I saw that one. No, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't do that. as uh, I mean once you listen to my music, you can find some like uh familiar characters hidden hidden in there. But uh let's say I don't I don't do such direct direct songs as, as this this person but it was hilarious though yeah yeah no no i must listen to that because um no i listened to it'd be interesting it'd be like trying to find like little easter eggs inside of a kind of bitcoin easter egg stuff but um but yeah so like so with bitcoin yourself so like like how long did it take to for you to get totally orange pit like you, say like the narrative um you said the block it was kind of blockchain not bitcoin like look i think everyone kind of does that for a while or at least they think bitcoin's first and then you know and then it's like you're like oh this is old tech what's next kind of thing um yeah I, did, yeah I totally like that that mentality of like myspace and then like facebook took over myspace that kind of idea that it, if it was the first it can't really be the last last like thing standing but that took me a while. But yeah, good question. I think what 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 really, and I think this is a bit of a cliche, but but really reading the Bitcoin standard was a really big thing for me because uh, it explained the importance of Bitcoin in this kind of a non-technical way, and also tied up to my earlier earlier background in studying sociology and economic and political science and these kind of things in the university, and then also my kind of a journey as a, as a like a punk rock slash alternative rock person and do it do it yourself kind of a rock rock musician uh it kind of all came together so a little bit of this that always having certain distrust on like what the 
so-called the man is telling us uh, <laughs> then a uh, uh, little bit of distrust on like how the kind of a uh, economic system is kind of sold to us uh and uh then the idea that you know what money actually is and and uh, how it's something that no nobody like i never thought about what money actually is even by running businesses quite big businesses at times it was just you know that was like the last thing you thought about what money is actually you just thought about how to make money or how to spend money but never what it is so that came came in there very nicely and then the kind of human rights human rights uh, um, aspects super important for me so that it, it, it can help those people that that kind of uh, uh, don't have the benefits of the kind of relatively safe and well-functioning kind of uh, infrastructure that we've been born into and then one really interesting thing for me was also the kind of game theory because i've been interested in game theory for a long time and i've been working in startups where we've been kind of trying to create these viral who loops and these kind of things and uh with bitcoin i i just saw something that i've never seen before that how can somebody create like an incentive loop that's so perfect that just runs on its own and just like sucks people in and makes them do stuff that is completely uh like they do it completely for their self-interest but at the same time it completely helps everybody else in the network it's completely incredible how the how the incentive structure uh, and the kind of game theory behind bitcoin works all the way from like individual hodlers to to speculative investors to miners to node runners to you know even the media even everything like, because we all know that you know the strike and effect is, effect is great when when you know famous people start attacking bitcoin then it just becomes stronger or when uh, china attacks on bitcoin then it just becomes stronger so it's just incredible how everything kind of works to its advantage in the long term obviously as as hodlers we take big hits <laughs> in short term every every couple of years but in the long term it's just like getting stronger and stronger all the time i know it's meant like you have you there's so many layers. like look i think everyone comes um in at least in the west initially they come for like you know the money uh it's making money you, you maybe somehow start to fall into kind of the inflation like you know inflation hedge kind of at least over the very long term which is evident more now i suppose but um people fall into that and then you have just but it's it's obvious that it's that way in the west but like i don't know you know you kind of you have a tendency to forget that like 75 percent of the world are like unbanked and they have no access to like payments infrastructure or anything whatsoever like so for those guys it's totally different and then you have like just all layers being built in bitcoin censorship resistance like um yeah it's the whole kind of what would probably end up being like the you know the web five stuff um that jack dorsey and all that's working on like building layers upon layers of different applications on bitcoin um so i suppose in a way well not that the blockchain not bitcoin was correct but there was there was something to it but just not how we all thought when we we joined like what five years ago whatever um but yeah so like it just just with regards like the whole see so kind of saying the idea like all roads lead to bitcoin um well a lot of different roads anyway the perfect incentive wheel um kind of you know get game theory all that good stuff like it's just i think i think we touched on a bit the conference like but what do you think like do, do you think that um bitcoin can like is there any way it's kind of failing around now do you have any concerns um like can there be better things like i suppose is there a way that this incentive fly will you think could, could be broken um and do you have any concerns around or anything that needs more work to help this be the case or to not be the case for it to be broken i think uh probably the the one thing that i'm worried about the most is that if um if and when uh mining becomes very centralized uh then there's a possibility of like you know censoring transactions and these kind of things on that front 
Uh, but now I think uh, with this uh, Stratum 2.0 or something like that that they're working on, which is allows that the uh, individual miners can basically basically uh, uh, organize those transactions that the pools don't have that kind of control that they can have right now. I think that's a kind of positive mutation that is happening there. But that's definitely a big big issue is is potentially that the mining pools can can be co-opted and and kind of a uh, you know, do stuff that is not good for the network. It hasn't happened yet in big scale, but it's it's possible. And second thing is that um, how do we improve the UX that we get more and more people to actually own Bitcoin and not just leave them on the exchanges and then like learn how to responsibly self custody without kind of burning themselves uh, and and doing it in a way that uh, you know feels natural that people don't feel like that they have to kind of. Uh, go into scary places in a way you know like being too reliant on themselves and stuff so we have some good good companies like i'd say unchained or casa that are trying to kind of for example teach people to use multisig in a way that is kind of friendly and doesn't feel like that you have to you know go to coding school for 10 years and and put your like life savings into something that you don't understand at all uh so there's good things happening there but that's the second one and uh and that related, obviously, what, for example, with what Matt Odell is always, always, uh, uh, you know, uh, advocating is this kind of a heightened sense of privacy that that people easily forget in this today's world where yeah, everything, you know, all the kind of do dopamine hits are one click away somewhere, and and you often, you know, just don't think about what you're sharing, and and uh, it's good that we have those, you know smart people in the in the scene that are trying to educate people you know now when when things like things are still relatively good you know yeah yeah no, there's yeah the stratum stratum v2 i think it's called and it just basically it kind of massively reduces the it just reduces the power of a pool to um you know to uh sense of transactions as you say the individual miners can break off from what the pool is doing but yeah no it's similar concerns and look especially around like bitcoin privacy stuff like that it's oh uh, yeah so yeah what, what you said around like so bitcoin privacy um is a massive one for me in fact it's probably the main one um and then the the wallet infrastructure so uh like at the moment you, you have that problem with and as well like obi's new thing fediment um like that's that's super interesting around this kind of the idea of the second party custody or whatever but um yeah like e even you say that like people if you get someone to ledger people discount like that are in the bitcoin space just how intimidating the ledger can be like i was talking to a guy recently who's been in bitcoin like a couple of years now he's kind of a total like you know he's he's older he's um kind of you know uh a school teacher background and he didn't he understands bitcoin understands all that has held it on coinbase the whole time um and he tried to you know he got ledger and he went to send some to ledger i don't know, i don't actually know how he managed to do it but he managed to lose the bitcoin he sent to ledger now he did he didn't oh. send it all yeah oh, <laughs> I, oh, he, oh. he 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 only sent like a couple of hundred quid or something but i i don't know how he <laughs> he managed to do it but like it's it's still it's nowhere near at that level where it's just like you know this just works like um for everyone so indeed, indeed. yeah um but uh yeah go on maybe on the privacy side also i think that uh one one thing that is kind of uh frustrating maybe more than worrying is 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 for example the European Union's uh, um, initiatives where they they kind of try to demonize in a way using the so-called unhosted wallets that like mm. custodying your own Bitcoin is somehow like a kind of have negative negative connotations in a way that like mm. it's better if you keep it in in some regulated exchange than if you if you don't do it then they try to make it you know. At least a little bit harder for example sending i think they're trying to impose a law that if you send from an exchange to an unhosted wallet then you have to somehow prove who owns that wallet and these kind of things so it's for me it's kind of funny that it's same organization that has this uh, gdpr like a groundbreaking uh, 
privacy protection laws in a way for people that uh, for example uh, TikTok or Facebook or uh, Google you know can't like just run rampant on your data uh, so, so they set some protections there uh, but then when it comes to your you know own money that you've earned and and what you want to do with that then then, then suddenly they're not so concerned about the privacy anymore so it's kind of a bit frustrating to see that kind of a uh, kind of dual morality morality in a way that is is there in the eu policies right now here in europe yeah and so like you, you said um you, you said the company you're involved with has built uh or the company that you own and run has built uh bitcoin infrastructure for an exchange in Finland and your ability to white label yourself like um so do you have like do you have much experience dealing with regulation in Finland like are is it are they hospitable towards it um yeah what's the story there yeah so personally I I, I don't have uh, um haven't dealt with the uh regulators in Finland in terms of like Bitcoin related businesses, like personally, but uh, the company that we acquired 2016, they had they had done that. And that was super early days. I mean, think about how much the regulators knew about Bitcoin in 2013, 14. <laughs> so it was like uh, very challenging at the time. Um, I do know we've been involved in some some startups here that that have have gotten even those kind of uh, EU wide licenses to do virtual asset services and, and these kind of things. So I think they are kind of trying hard. Um, and I've been involved in, in this kind of WhatsApp group uh, related to, to kind of um, the digital asset regulation in, in, in European Union and collecting like feedback from the industry here in, in Finland. And uh, there's been some of the regulator people in the same chat. And I think at, 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 at least they seem to have this kind of open mind and, and kind of solution oriented mindset but we'll see we'll see how far that will go i you know finland is known as like uh the holy land of of regulation in a way uh and for the most part it's it's pretty smart regulation to kind of uh, create a safe environment for people to kind of live their lives and build their businesses uh but uh i'd say that in this case it might even be that the finnish people will be you know more bitcoin friendly in a way than the, the actual eu eu head office people in a way so so it might be interesting to see like uh, how much we can influence from finland to make it like more reasonable and how much it comes from like that christian lagarde camp of like just make it as hard hard to use as possible so we'll we'll see how it goes but i'm i have have high hopes of the kind of uh finnish regulators that they they do the right things or try to do the right things so in like overall in finland are they actually granting licenses is it a is it a friendly regulatory environment or because it just for example in ireland there's been two licenses well only one of them is a proper license but there's been two um well technically they're not even licenses they're just authorizations but uh there's been there's been two granted um out of like you know like <laughs> I had like 600 applications or something and this has been going on for years so ireland is like you know obviously within the eu as well but the regulatory environment is just totally like totally hostile so it sounds a, like it i suppose is there a bit of a bitcoin business community in finland yeah not? well if you think about uh, uh local business lo local bitcoins uh this very famous kind of og company in the space is a finnish company and from oh, finland wow. so so in a way, uh, there's been a successful business, Bitcoin related business from here, you know, probably one of the oldest ones that is still kind of vibrant and ongoing. Uh, so in a way, they've had experience with like successful Bitcoin business in the Finnish business environment for a very long time, probably like well, close to 10 years. Uh, and I, I know that uh, uh, at least two companies that have gotten the licenses uh, from the regulators haven't been super easy but it's been possible to do and i even met an entrepreneur in amsterdam that was from switzerland which supposedly like the kind of a great place for banking and like let's say flexible banking that's what it's known for in a way and he said that 
his comp- Bitcoin company's bank account is going to be a Finnish bank account. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a new thing for me that we have a startup from Switzerland of you know creating the banking relationships in Finland. So I guess so, something good is happening there. Yeah, that's good. I, I think the big problem in Ireland is that like look, although I'm not sure about the EU regulators as a whole, I think they're quite quite hostile towards you know Bitcoin in general. But like um in Ireland it's not so much Bitcoin on a local level. It's more the fact that uh, Ireland just a very conservative after, you know, the whole 2008 banking crisis, which was very heavily, there's some Irish banks that went under, like, so, um, and the regulators took a lot of blame. And, you know, it's the same people in there, like, so they just don't, if it's any way, like, not already there, they just say no to everything, more or less. <laughs> um, which is a massive pr- problem for Bitcoin here. But then, you, look, you have these, it sounds like there's, there's a bit going on in Finland, but, you know, places like Lithuania are very, very Bitcoin friendly. And there's loads going on there. Um, but, yeah, and, and just the community in general, like, in Finland, how does it look? Is there a bit of a, is there a pleb scene? Is there meetups? Um, is rents is it more crypto focused or bitcoin focused um yeah what's what's the story there yeah so my my sense is that we have a pretty good uh, bitcoin community here the funny thing is that uh, my job is quite international so like i travel travel a lot to southeast asia and middle east all the time so i've been on this meetup group for for like a helsinki bitcoin hobbyists meetups that they have once a month and i've tried to go there for like five six times <laughs> and every time something happens i have to you know either ki- kids are kid is sh- sick or or uh, i'm traveling somewhere or something something have happened so i haven't made it there yet but i know some some people uh from the scene and and we have some great bitcoiners at our co- working at our company by the way i just want to make clarification on earlier that uh at oivan i'm the ceo and co-founder so i'm not the kind of sole owner of the company okay, okay. One, one of the one of the many many founder founder owners of the company so we have a good scene here um and then we have for example the the consensus network which is this really cool starfish uh like a book publishing organization mm-hmm. focusing on bitcoin uh run by this finnish guy nico uh, i've never met him but uh, what they're doing is, is really really cool stuff and uh, then we have the younger generation kind of understandably is very ex- has been very excited about the kind of non bitcoin related stuff so nfts web3 that the usual story and uh, when i speak with these people i i listen and uh, and uh, then i just try to kind of guide them to that that you know sooner or later you will realize that bitcoin is like the the main show here and that uh, if you th- think about that you would like to tinker and build and you know build fast and 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 uh, break things all those kind of startup philosophy things then you know take a look at the second layers and third layers of bitcoin maybe you can find like a better place to to build your stuff there rather than go to solana or polkadot or whatever you're kind of doing right now but again it's just me one little blip trying to trying to kind of uh, put my ideas out there some of them uh, are listening and and most of them are like well, you can keep your boomer coin, and I'll I'll go build my my NFT platform on on, on Solana. <laughs> so then I'll say like, good luck. <laughs> See you in a few years. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think that as well. The whole it's that culture. Um, build fast and break things. I don't actually think you know. Like I'm obviously from startup background as well. Like that's actually it's good for startups. But like the problem is that a lot of the money in Silicon Valley has been like you know. They, VC money comes in, big money, and they want to. They, they believe the same stuff that we believed initially about, you know, Bitcoin's old tech, blockchain's next, and then they bring that culture towards these, uh, you know, smart contract DeFi platforms, all that kind of stuff, and it's just like, uh, you know, that's how you get like a, a five hundred million dollar hack of like everyone's money just disappears, like that kind of stuff. So <laughs> pretty, pretty much every week, you know, it's just like you, you can. Whether it's five million or fifty million or five hundred million, you know that that might might vary. But every week we hear about one or one or two of those those hacks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Plus also the kind of um, 
incentive structure for the VCs has been kind of insane. Uh, like in the traditional startup world, the VCs actually had to take a lot of risk on, on like finding the right founders and with the right ideas, putting a lot of money in there and then kind of writing that that company's journey for like five to 10 years before they say see any paydays and the company actually ha has to kind of uh, find the product market fit and you know start get that kind of growth curve in the right way whereas in with this crypto space you just you know make a nice looking landing page and have some like uh, famous people in that team and then you make some kind of a uh, obviously you pre-mine and, and give the vc so you know 20 to 30 percent of those tokens and then you just do some kind of a campaign and get the get the shitcoin kids excited about it and then just dump dump it on the retail and it's like now they what took five to ten years to get that you know payback now it takes you know five to ten months basically to get the payback and then like it's it's kind of crazy i think it it does not incentivize people to build like quality projects in a way where you can kind of monetize even before <laughs> launching even for the most most part that's what i like about I bitcoin. bitcoin businesses because they are often built with much less money and with much more conviction and much more like that we are here for not only to get rich but to to kind of uh, uh, build something uh, you know solid and and tangible that actually helps people around the world in the long term and that's why it, that appeals me it appeals to me that philosophy much more than this kind of get get rich quick type of thing that is very prevalent in the in the shitcoin space yeah exactly i totally agree and as well i think that like vcs in general so like yeah, don't get me wrong i don't think there's anything wrong with vcs like they're definitely or or even the the premise behind it but i think i've always thought vcs are like or venture capital is kind of quite fiat really you know like a lot of the massive vc funds could just get access like they're quite close to the money printer um you know the canceling effect all that so they get super cheap uh, money plunge it into startups whatever or you know at later stage startups sometimes and they the risk return isn't even really that big a deal because you know unlimited money at like close to you know very very low interest rates and like it's like they've i don't know will it keep working it's, it's unclear because the bull we're in a bear market at the moment but it's like now it's the fiat it's what you said about the incentive structure it's just turned much more insane again like because they can just get a, a more or less an immediate exit into the pump which um yeah just just wrecks like i, I know so many people that uh you know just even recently just lost absolutely tons of money like into these vc projects which the most vast majority of them are and yeah it's just just an education thing which is um i, I do think there's a lot of people coming around there like you know these events there's a lot of uh people who have kind of quote unquote seen the lights you know um so it'd, be, it'd just be interesting to see does it can this happen like in a massive way for like a third time round now um and the next bitcoin bull market and it remains to be seen if there's enough of a network of people to kind of call this out like enough of a consciousness to for new people to realize what's happening what what do you think probably yeah it's gonna be <laughs> that, that that's why we're here. it's so interesting to see i mean you know every every time we predict something that is certainly gonna happen then the opposite typically happens but <laughs> but uh it's going to be exciting to see. I think in the end, there is this very positive kind of a loop going on that that every cycle, a bunch of people get in trying to get rich quick. Some of them go to Bitcoin. Most of them go to the shit coins and, and NFTs and that kind of stuff. And then everything just comes crashing down. Happens every time. But some of those people who came in have had time to kind of realize that hey there's there's bitcoin is is special it it stands on completely like aside from everything else and so every cycle we get a few people that go through that blockchain at bitcoin kind of journey and then come into bitcoin and like, okay uh, this is the real deal this is something that i really believe that has can can exist for hundreds of years and, and help everybody on this planet and hopefully beyond even and 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 then once that cycle goes but then on on top of that the 
the UX is getting better. So every cycle, the UX is also getting better. So so now when people come in, they have a, like a softer pillow to land in, in a way. So so they they don't have to kind of like think about people who came into Bitcoin like 2014, 15, <laughs> like try to figure out you know how to self custody and 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 all these kind of things. Then even in the last cycle, we already had ledgers and 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 these kind of things. Now this cycle we have like unchains and casas and 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 always it's getting better. And and next cycle we have like much more of like easy access services that are well built by true bitcoiners with the kind of uh, demonstrating the right philosophy behind. So I'd say that the the game theory again is working to our advantage that over time you know more and more people will will kind of see the light so to speak and become like like true bitcoiners as we are yeah so like you, you've obviously been a like successful tech entrepreneur now for like you know 20 years why um or been in the space in tech in general in 20 years and the whole build fast break things mantra um you're well aware of do Look, so I suppose, do you think that, um, like, is there actually anything that interests you that you think could, that is, say, you know, stuff being done on Solana or DeFi or all coins, stable coins, whatever. Um, is there anything you think that has, like, potential to be either being done on Bitcoin or to be done on Bitcoin that's working to some degree on other chains um, that, like, I, I suppose we we might agree that long term because they're it's not bitcoin they may be destined to fail or whatever or maybe you might not agree um totally but yeah is is there anything interesting happening outside of bitcoin itself that maybe you would like to see come to bitcoin or just think it's interesting or compelling in general yeah definitely i think uh, the easy one is is obviously stable coins because they just make so much sense for for people, especially uh, who are living outside of the USD, Euro, Euro world, uh, if you live in uh, Argentina or Turkey or, you know, any, any place where the local currency is, is like uh, severely mismanaged, uh, then uh, having access to stable coins, especially USD based stable coins makes perfect sense because like you don't you don't want to risk your family's like food budget on 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 some dump when when a billionaire decides that that they don't accept bitcoin anymore you don't want to lose your family's food budget for the month because of that so so stable coins definitely make sense for people uh, now we have these projects like taro that they're trying to build do this on bitcoin which i think is super interesting to see how it works out in practice uh, you know the trust issues with stable coins are, are quite quite large now especially after what happened with that that Luna thing. Um, so I think, in that sense, Tether and USDC that are like the have been around for quite a long time, and and although they do have their own like let's say reputation issues uh, with Tether, it's about like what what is their actual like uh, you know collateral situation, and on the USDC side is that like they might be a bit too cozy with uh, with the regulators and stuff. Uh, but but still, it's going to be hard for anybody else to compete with these two because they are so like entrenched already. But uh, at the same time, it's going to be interesting to see if those Bitcoin-based uh, uh, stable coins become a thing and succeed. Uh, I think the ideal use case for anybody in the world outside of you know EU, EU. Well, actually, I could even add EU there now with with Euro, you know, like a tanking as it is. So so I think everybody in the world probably would benefit of having like one wallet where you have your Bitcoin savings account and then USD based uh, stable coins that you can just switch around and use the other one for everyday stuff and the other one for saving. It just make, makes perfect sense for everybody, but especially in the, in the so-called uh, ascending world. And, and uh, uh, that's one thing. And then the other things, I mean, I... You know, you would think that I would be like inclined to think about NFTs on on Bitcoin and stuff, considering that I come from like the creative side that I I do music and, and stuff. But I just it for me it feels kind of forced. 
it it's just like an unnecessary kind of layer on top like i just like my bitcoin as bitcoin and then like my music as my music and if you if if somebody thinks that my music is worth something then they can just send me some sets like that's that's all i care about so i don't think at least personally i'm not a big fan of of thinking about doing like nfts on bitcoin and stuff like that i don't see like i don't get too excited about that stuff personally and then the DeFi side in a way that is kind of a DeFi app if you have that app where you have your stable coins and bitcoin in the same app because you can kind of you know trade trade with those two, two that that pair I think they're doing interesting projects now, trying to build these kind of a DeFi platforms on Bit Bitcoin, uh, where which are like outside of any or, uh, companies that are running it, or you don't have any kind of CEOs that you can go and arrest and these kind of things. It's interesting to see what's going to happen there, but uh, we'll most likely be a little bit uh, uh, fringe in a way, as long as those altcoins exist, because then the people who are really have that gambling mindset will most likely just to go and gamble with <laughs> with, with those uh, uni, uniswap things anyway so so i think it's valuable to have something similar in the bitcoin ecosystem how popular will it be that remains to be seen yeah that's interesting what you said about especially around the nfts um uh the fact that you know you come from a kind of that creative angle and you don't really because personally I, I feel like nfts are like uh a product in search of a market and that like it's I, I just don't get it at all like i i get it but i don't <laughs> like you i don't want one i don't feel any need for them um but yeah it's just interesting yeah it's interesting you, from that angle um but yeah stable coins as well yeah it's super interesting um i think this is a, a, interesting to get your takes on this. Like recently, I kind of came to the conclusion that um, because with our business, like with Bitcoin back loans, what we're doing is, you know, we're starting off with stable coin loans and we were looking at doing uh, like there's a couple of euro stable coins. So, for example, there's um, uh, Circle have their own version of they have a new one now called Eurocoin, uh, it's their own version of the USDC, but in euros. Um, and their tether have had euro tether for a couple of years um but there doesn't i it, it just seems there's no demand from whatsoever um yeah yeah because, i've been yeah yeah we, i've been approached uh, uh our company has been approached to to build like a euro stable coin project but i was like just like why would anybody need it like when you already have the usd stable coins because I mean, I could potentially see a case, perhaps, uh, if a company would like to have some money in their treasury, in like their local currency, it would be difficult for them to hold USD or something like that. But it's really kind of fringe case. I don't think there's a big demand for it. So I think as long as uh, USD is the kind of leading leading fiat currency in the world, I don't think any any other stable coins make a lot of sense than than USD personally yeah that's interesting i i do wonder there is something though i wonder um in especially circular well the circular obviously and there's a euro tether but i know circular pushing the their euro one much more um even though no one wants it there's there's there, I, I wonder there's in the upcoming mica regulation there is something about they're trying to restrict um if, if i don't know how they're going to do it but like You'd assume they have some plan, but I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that's the wrong assumption. Maybe they just don't understand. Um, but they're talking about if I think it's if you transact more than two hundred million dollars in a non uh two or two hundred million euros, they they're basically they're trying to restrict USDT and USDC's daily volume within Europe. Um, so maybe they're gonna try and push a regulatory point of view. Yeah, a regulatory angle to say that like only euro stable coins are allowed in Europe on exchanges or something. Um, and maybe Tether and Circle know something that we don't there, so maybe that's what they're doing. But it's yeah, it's a bit of a head scratcher. Like it is, and that was the second thing that when when this uh, project was proposed to us, 
uh, I said one one side is the demand. So I don't see that there's going to be like a growing demand on 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 a euro stable coin. It was like a, over a year ago, and I definitely the demand for euros has gone <laughs> gone down ever since. And and second thing was the regulatory thing because it seems to me that the, the way they are designing that that law right now is that somehow that it's okay to run these smaller like euro stable coins in Europe as long as you they are like. A, highly regulated uh, but then if it goes big enough then it's not okay anymore which is kind of crazy crazy incentive model that why would you build something that's supposed to scale like in a way infinitely but then there's like a roof glass roof that you can't can't hit so it's like a double double disincentives to to do anything related to that at least from my personal perspective and then i think the eu most likely has some um uh dreams to to launch some euro uh cbdc at some point but yeah we'll see we'll see if they get around that and what 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 do you think of that what's your opinions around that stuff like personally i think especially in america um usdc has a very big opportunity to become the cbdc the way they're going but yeah what, what do you think of euro cbdc cbdc's in general yeah well i think in europe uh especially when the market has already shown that the interest of like euro stable coins is not very high so i don't think it's it's going to be a very easy sell uh to have like a uh ecb cbdc that people will just like like happily hand over their cash and just start using it like as like hey this is actually a great improvement to my life I, 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 I don't see that happening that, that easily. Uh, in the US, it's a bit different because the USDC and, uh, has already kind of uh, proven itself in the market that people like it. And they're, they're, they already have like, a, you know, people happily, you know, whenever they need like dollar denominated uh, liquidity, they happily put it in the USDC. So like they, 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 you don't have to ask people twice. They either choose Tether or USDC. So in that case, it might be the best option for you us government to kind of just lean on that because the, the users are all already there and then the technology is already there and uh, the track record of governments doing these huge fintech digital service platforms that that should work 100 percent at all times is not not very high uh so there's there's a big risk in in launching something something uh in Europe, for example, if the ECB tries to do their CBDC and build it themselves, launch it, it's it's going to be tough. Not only from the from the technical side, but also like the market adoption side. I, I I'm not sure so sure that people will be like super excited about that. At, at least at the scale that that they they they'd like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I I suppose I think the CBDCs is like. I don't know, would it ever really have been a thing unless Bitcoin, you know, if Bitcoin was never invented, like how would that work? Because, yeah. So it's kind of like the problem, their massive problem with CBDCs is that they're competing. And it's the same with the same thing with Eurocoin. Um, was it, if you take a European uh, CBDC, it's exactly the same thing with, with Circles, Eurocoin, that no one really wants it. They have to compete in a global... You know they're competing in a global free market of stable coins which is the same way that like for a fiat based thing is just going to trend all towards the one um which i think is like a monetary law or something it's like uh is that like gresham's law or something like that um but at the same time they don't care <laughs> they try and just make the laws and say this is so so it'd be it'd be interesting to see um i mean there might be some out. like uh yeah, I think there might be some like uh, manufactured market opportunities that that perhaps they know something that there's some regulation coming that they're gonna box people into like have a captive audience for a certain kind of usage. But it can only work for a while, and uh, you might kind of reap some benefits as long as that kind of whatever prison you are building is kind of the walls are st are st still there. But you're gonna piss off a lot of people, and and people will find find their way out, and then the whole thing will collapse. So, it can be you know temporary at best, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. So, 
It's just in a just a, a couple of other things. Like, so, like, what do you think? Um, like, what what do you think needs to be built in Bitcoin that that isn't being built at the moment? Is there anything you have like you think you kind of burning desire for a need that may, maybe you're not building, but like you think that other people should or that needs to be done? That's a great question. Um, I have to say I'm I'm very impressed uh, on on what the community is building right now, especially now when we are in this bear market times where kind of most of the excitement is gone from. Uh, especially if you look from the outside in. Uh, so the stuff that's happening with the Lightning Network is just mind blowing. Uh, stuff that is happening with the value for value kind of business models. That's great It's in the early days, but that's awesome. One thing I'm super interested in is about the, the g gaming, like the Thunder games and these startups that are, are building games where people kind of start earning Bitcoin, like a few sets here and there without having to think about it at all in a way. So that's a great way to kind of onboard people in the Bitcoin world while making it fun and not intimidating at all. So that's super exciting. Uh, and then what we are also working at Oivan with this Hatch project is to try to make it as seamless and easy for people to kind of buy their first Bitcoin and, and then educate them and encourage them to to store it themselves whether if it's a self custody mobile wallet or or, or hard, hardware wallet uh you know anywhere besides that exchange that you used to buy it in the first uh, like uh in the first place you know try to try to teach people how to custody themselves that's really interesting and all the kind of educational things how can we how can we kind of explain bitcoin in a more friendly way in a more kind of story storytelling way because it's a very complicated subject it's like anybody who has studied for five to ten years still only knows like a part of it because not only is it super complicated it's evolving every day so it's a really difficult subject to to kind of explain so, so the more we can find ways that, that are kind of adaptable, that for this kind of person, this message works, for this kind of person, this UX works, for this kind of person, this kind of onboarding works, you know, this person can be onboarded through gaming, this person can be onboarded through saving, these kind of things that if we think about it as a community and business community, I think there's a lot of opportunity there in the future. Yeah, there's a huge um as well you're talking about the gaming there like i was talking to um recent one of the conferences and he actually be a guest in the podcast in a few weeks but uh one of the guys from not thunder which is a little bit different but uh zebedee they're kind of like yeah yeah that's a cool one yeah. as well yeah yeah but like it's now i don't know he they, they were taking more i think their main point is that i don't think they develop games so much it's more allowing like in, uh integrations into like say payments in Bitcoin within games and stuff like that, but um, there's a massive. He, well, he he wasn't talking too much specifically around what I'm about to say, but I kind of realized after it's just a, a huge market opportunity. Um, I chatted him briefly on it, and it definitely has been done. But uh, esports and Bitcoin, and they're talking yeah. about um, and I don't know. I I can imagine there being all kinds of regulatory problems around this, but because Bitcoin is borderless. If the company sets like if a company sets themselves up right there could be a massive market for like um because i'm just thinking gambling regulation stuff like that where you know you can totally just monetize um a game so say like if you're playing like uh csgo or something they could just have competitions that like just totally pay in pay out in bitcoin like that kind of thing um which will just make a massive uh, now the problem around that there could be ish like genuine issues around not even the regulation but just like i'd imagine a lot of bad actors would flood the space for gambling stuff like that but it, it, it really is very interesting because like i know when i was younger i used to play a lot of uh that kind of thing and it would have been great fun to be able to you know get 10 guys in a game and everyone puts in 10 quids worth of bitcoin and the winner kind of takes it all like yeah <laughs> but uh Yes, the stuff like that. Like, but to be honest, I think that um, the, like this is literally only like I, I'm the same as yourself. Like, we're deep in the bear market. There's there's loads of people building, and I think it's it's only it's like it's only just scratching the surface because now there's now we have that kind of level of entrepreneur. It was like like 
to say when you joined or anyone like Jack Dorsey, any of these people, everyone believed at the time the kind of the blockchain that Bitcoin's old blockchain is new. So anyone that even begin to understood cryptocurrency in Bitcoin that was a capable entrepreneur didn't have the same didn't have the level of understanding of Bitcoin necessary to understand where where, where we believe the Bitcoin space is going. And now that level, the, the the number of people who understand this is being raised more and more with, with every passing week so that we're getting the, this huge market opportunities that maybe people are trying to solve with crypto and, and realizing that this is where it actually is at and there's people who are capable enough to solve these problems because they're getting their Bitcoin education up to a high enough level. So I, I just think the whole thing's going to explode. And I do think there is another thing. Like I know, I know I was kind of um, saying about VCs earlier, but like, look, there, there definitely is a, a need for a lot of things for, and a lot of these Bitcoin projects are backed by like Bitcoin VCs and stuff. So there is, there is a need for VCs, but like there's a problem in Bitcoin at the moment where there's a, a mismatch between like, vcs in general believe that you know if they don't under if they're in the crypto space for the most part they're investing in you know these as you said the crazy incentive structure they're investing in crazy crazy projects but then people who have a lot of bitcoin don't unless it's kind of more from a philanthropic lens don't really want it doesn't really make too much sense to them to involve to invest in bitcoin projects from a risk reward basis at the moment um because like it's almost like there is probably like it, bitcoin if you look at bitcoin itself and you believe bitcoin is going to go to like a purchasing power value today of like 10 million dollars or something it's quite rare that like you're going to get any any kind of anywhere near to the level of guaranteed return from a startup so i think in the next three or four years what we'll see is after the next bull run or during it that kind of changes that that in inverts so that people who now like there'll be a ton of people who have made who understand bitcoin have made a ton more money and now are, are willing to start releasing some of that funds into bitcoin companies which will then kind of spur the thing to the next level so i suppose the point i'm making is this is just all totally getting started and like you know who knows like y y your company has just started dabbling in bitcoin in in five years your your whole company <laughs> could be bitcoin like um i think that's uh, the, well uh, yeah obviously that, that that'd be up to you but i i think it's the same way that like with my company like we were working in bitcoin around bitcoin and eventually we just start to sink more and more into it and it's like now we we're not really doing anything else over in bitcoin so um i think if that's the that's the natural path but um yeah well, what what do you think about that I think that that's uh, uh, very much how I think of it as well. Uh, the Bitcoin VCs, if I just say a few words on those, I think those are kind of great because they are run by people who come more from the kind of philosophical angle rather than like the quick quick wins, um, like you know the 10, 1031s and these kind of companies. It seems to me that they are, they are investing in in more like long-term projects. And, and then uh, on the other hand, the, the entrepreneurs themselves don't expect to get like, you know, enormous amount of money to, to build something. They, 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 they get by with less because they are so, the conviction is so high that, you know, they will <laughs> happily work there. Anyway, they just need enough to get going and get forward, but it's not this excess that has been seen. Like for example, a couple of years ago, ago when those scooter startups came all over the world, like and everybody was just raising like 100 million, 200 million, 500 million, and kind of crazy. So Bitcoin investing today is more like reasonable in a sense. But yeah, definitely once um, once we get to these uh, really high big highs one, uh, over time, you know whether it's two years, five years, ten years, we probably nobody knows exactly when. But once we get to these levels where like these ridiculous stops again i'm sure that there's going to be more and more uh, people who are um, come from the business background and kind of investment background and at that time then they'll their possibility to invest in 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 new startups is uh quite quite good and and then i definitely think that some of some of them maybe even i will will then 
you know, put some of that Bitcoin to work uh, for the benefit of the community. Although, for the most part, every time you you depart from your Bitcoin <laughs> in five to ten years, like, why did I buy that beer? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know, I know, and I actually think there's a massive market opportunity, and maybe it's something yet like you guys could look at is uh, no, I I don't know the regular stuff around it, but like just literally like like I'd love to spend in Lightning because I, I do think that like Bitcoin spending is going to become more of a thing in a slow way over the next five to ten years, not the way that people thought it would happen. You know, just at these conferences, for example, everyone's spending Lightning because everyone's so like you know um what's the word uh passionate's not the word but like yeah like a fanatical like um that that faction's going to grow more but like i love an app where i could just i could spend in lightning but then it just auto buys it just auto replaces immediately what i've spent oh yeah 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 that account. makes sense yeah that's actually um, a good idea and then also, there's also things that for example in finland uh if you spend up to thousand euros worth of of bitcoin a year then you don't have to do any reporting for the tax tax authorities so i'm just like thinking out loud perhaps we could have an app in finland that would be uh that up to thousand euros you could just spend your sats any way you want like buy coffees and 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 whatever you need to buy and then then if, if it goes over that then it either says that now it's time to start making tax reports or or then wait until next year <laughs> or until the government raises that that level <laughs> but that's yeah. one thing yeah that that could work because like the one thing that in the everyday use obviously the big issue is the income tax reporting which is kind of a kind of crazy that was even back in the day when uh facebook was doing that libra project that their stablecoin project that kind of failed completely by the way that guy who was running it now he has big lightning lightning startup nowadays <laughs> uh at the time i wrote a blog post uh about it uh i think it was even published in some like finnish business magazine or like i was interviewed in that that it was like impossible project in finland because it was um tied to a basket of, of they were planning to tie to the basket of fiat currencies so it would fluctuate to towards the euro price you know yeah maybe not a lot but a little bit so basically it would mean that you would have to file in tax reports every time you buy like uh coffee or something like that so it was kind of doomed to fail from that sense as well yeah yeah so um yeah as yeah there, there is an interesting uh there's an interesting product that came across um i suppose we'll just wrap up after this as well but the in interesting product is um you can actually get you can get like a for the app i just said for spending bitcoin day to day rather than a buy but rather than a buy or spend your bitcoin and then it automatically re restacks what you spent um you could actually get like a crypto kind of credit uh or a bitcoin credit card that issues a credit which isn't too dissimilar from what we're doing but it issues a credit line um once you're buying once you're spending the bitcoin so so you go sorry you go into the shop you have your card um you want to spend it spends in fiat but it draws the credit line from the bitcoin you have so it doesn't oh, it doesn't incur okay, okay. doesn't yeah, incur okay. a tax event but it's the, the, obviously the massive problem there is i think you could do it you could do it nationally um and there's actually a possibility you, you might be ex exempt in each european country from consumer credit legislation but like you could do it nationally but at the moment you wouldn't be able to do that like it wouldn't be like something like revolut where they get licensed in lithuania and then they can operate all over europe because there is that framework isn't there yet but um, yeah. I, ex I expect we'll start to see stuff like that when the the regulatory clarity gets better e even if it's maybe somewhat hostile it, it, it should it should be possible to do those kind of things which is interesting um but yeah, so like, what's what's next for for you in the space? Where can people find you? And like, say say with Hatch, like your your um internal product, what's uh what's the hope for that? What what are you looking to do? Yeah, so the for us right now, it's something that we do as um uh, like a long term project, and and we put not too much resources right not right now there to to promote it but but we are seeing the first because we know that the market is not ready for the most part for those like old school companies to kind of embrace bitcoin it will take some time for most of them especially here in the northern europe 
Uh, but we are now seeing first kind of uh, we have first discussions of of cases in Europe that we are kind of uh, doing the first implementations of Hatch with with uh, some financial institutions in Southern Europe. Uh, hopefully, get those live next year, and then uh, keep talking to people. Keep uh, we also have a lot of stuff happening in the Middle East, so we're talking with local local companies, local you know public uh, institutions there about what we're doing, and uh, you know. My thesis is that, you know, as you stick around as as hodling, you know, just stick around and and don't lose your nerve and keep building and keep talking and keep, you know, believing. Uh, and then over time, you know, the business will start accumulating. So that's kind of our plan plan there with Hatch, because uh, the other other side of our company that is just building these huge digital transformation projects is that's where kind of the meat today is in, in our business. But this Hatch is a really cool cool new thing that we're doing and and, and first signs of, of of kind of it working are are kind of starting to show, show up and then other other things i do i have the the higher low so at the higher low and the higher low.com you can find my acoustic black rock or maximalist pop punk songs if you're interested and uh yeah that that's about it that's that's me and my own personal twitter handle is at rami korhonen probably Tough to tough to get from from my speech, but most likely in this podcast notes, my name is somewhere there. So it's just my first name, first name, last name, one word at easy. Sure, yeah, yeah, it'll it'll be in the description anyway. But so and then look, just to clear up, um, so if institutions, so with Hatch, the idea is that if financial institutions like banks or whatever EMIs want to integrate Bitcoin, they can just come to you guys and plug in with with your you have it all kind of ready. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because the same same team that built it uh, in house for us uh, originally built a Bitcoin broker service in 2013. So, like for nine years, they've been building on this space. So, very experienced team, and 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 they this time they built it in a way that you know, after doing it basically three times in nine years, this was the time that they like finally kind of this is the way we're supposed to build it the first time <laughs> nine years ago so super proud of the kind of very clean nice nice code and the idea is just that like if you open a banking app uh you normally can do the normal things get your salaries pay your bills whatever sometimes you have like a little button there like invest in stock market so the idea is that one day you could have a button like invest in bitcoin and and that's where we have everything you need to do it so we have the, the code the integrations with liquidity providers, all the uh, um, secure custody solution, everything is there. So instead of you know hiring fifty developers and starting to read like mastering Bitcoin on how to how to build it, you can <laughs> come to us and we can kind of just plug and play and paint it in your colors and off you go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Um, so okay then. Thanks, Rami, and uh, we will. Yeah, we'll speak to you again. Sounds great. Thanks, Jack. It was my pleasure and good luck with everything. And let's keep stacking and staying humble. <laughs> sure. Okay. Great stuff. Great stuff. Bye.